Sailors, regardless of the Navy or era, have something of a reputation. A reputation as utter madmen who come up with some of the wackiest ideas imaginable. Be it out of boredom or necessity, these men can think up weird things and make them work. Take, for example, the crew of Yavuz using their turrets as aircraft cranes. Today's video will look at the United States Navy and two other examples, both of which are the same thing, but at different times and on entirely different kinds of ship. A destroyer and a submarine, respectively. Not exactly the kind of things you expect to see under sail. And I do mean that literally, with sails and all. As there is more to cover with the submarine, we'll begin there. That sub, USS R-14, is best known for the following incident. She had been sent out to search for a missing tugboat, the Constatoga. At the time, in May of 1921, the Pacific Fleet was nowhere near the size it would become. As such, R-14, a small coastal submarine, was used as part of the search effort, where things went very wrong. Not only was there no sign of the missing ship, but the crew found themselves in a situation where they would need to be rescued instead. After 10 days of searching for the missing tug, the submarine had run out of usable fuel. What made it more problematic was that R-14 had left on such short notice that she only carried 14 days of food and water. Which, if you're keeping track, means she was down to 4 days at this point. With her radio failing as well, R-14 was stuck adrift with limited supplies. She was a small speck off of the usual shipping lanes, so relying on someone stumbling by was not exactly ideal. It is at this point that the sailor ingenuity comes into play. On May 12, 1921, Lieutenant Alexander Douglas had an idea. Knowing that he lacked enough fuel to return to port, he had already ordered the submarine to turn off all non-essential electrical instruments. Right down to the oven, forcing the crew to eat cold food with their rationed water supply. So, with this situation in mind, what did Douglas and his crew come up with? The solution was simple, ingenious, and utterly insane all the same. Douglas would simply sail R-14 back to Hawaii, in the very literal sense of the word sail. A foresail made of 12 hammocks was sewed together by the crew. This was attached to the torpedo loading crane, along with a top boom made from five pipes taken from bunks lashed together. This created a sail just ahead of the conning tower a sail about 25 feet wide and 6 feet high that could be swiveled to catch the wind, which the crew did, setting a course for Hawaii. The submarine took the sail like an old longboat, even managing to use her rudder, if very slowly and very carefully, and only for minor course adjustments. Although, on the one sail, R-14 was only making around one knot. I'm almost more impressed that they even managed that much. A submarine is not exactly designed to take a sail. At any rate, Douglas ordered a mainsail made of six blankets, in addition to the already MacGyvered sail. This second sail would be attached to the radio mast at the after end of the conning tower. With a broken radio, it wasn't exactly getting any use. Might as well stick an impromptu sail on there and make it something other than dead weight. With the radio mass sail added on, R-14 can now make around one and a half knots. Again, I'm honestly impressed that a radio mast rigged up with a bedsheet sail could add half a knot to the submarine's speed. If there was anything good about this situation, though, it was that the weather was calm and the wind gentle. While a stronger wind might have helped with the speed, it could also have put R-14 at real risk of healing over and capsizing. This was a small coastal submarine, which wasn't great on the surface to begin with. Strong winds catching the sail in the wrong way? That would not have ended well. With the need to keep men on deck to manage the sails, that was even more of a concern. You didn't want those men falling overboard or upsetting the fragile stability of the boat. Nonetheless, Douglas would order a third sail put together. This created an impromptu mizzenmast made out of eight blankets, more bunk frames, and the after part of the torpedo loading crane. This third sail increased speed to around two knots. 
This allowed for charging the batteries, if slowly, by turning the propellers. The slow speed was still enough to do that much. So, if you're keeping track, you have a coastal submarine in 1921, operating under three sails made from bedding and bed frames, and managing two knots, with her crew doing their best Viking longship impersonation, minus the oars. R-14 must have looked like some bizarre time-traveling submarine at this point. Her crew was dead tired, meanwhile, having worked non-stop to get the sails together and then operate them. With a good chunk of their bedding torn apart for the sails as well, they had little in the way of sleeping arrangements when they weren't on shift topside. Even so, their spirits had been lifted, and the submarine sailed home. By May 14th, she was only about 25 miles away from Hilo, although at her speed, it would be another day to get there which is when Mother Nature decided to give them one last scare. This was at midnight on the 15th, and saw the gentle wind reverse, along with fog and rain, creating a soupy mess for several hours. For that time, R-14 was lowered back to a knot, and her crew couldn't see much. The speed had been lowered by a current of about a knot, pushing back against the boat. As if Nature was saying, impressive, but here's one last test. However, with morning came clear weather, and R-14 was close enough to see the lights of the island. Douglas, at about 5 a.m. that morning, ordered the batteries turned on, and the sails stowed. R-14 sailed under her own power into Hilo at that point, having been under sail for 64 hours. This remains an incredibly impressive tale of ingenuity at sea. Another submarine, USS Grenadier, attempted the same thing during the Second World War after she was damaged by Japanese attack. This would not have the same happy ending. Japanese surface forces would come up and put an end to that attempt. But that's a story for another video. To round off this one, we have the other success story. This one won't be nearly as long because there seems to be much less written material about it. Probably because, while an impressive feat, it wasn't a life-or-death incident. The incident in question being a destroyer crew rigging sails on their masts in 1940. The ship was USS Tucker, a Mahan-class destroyer, fairly typical of interwar American destroyer design and an otherwise unremarkable ship, both in design and her service history, which saw her earn only one battle star during the Pacific War. That said, the most interesting part of Tucker's career is definitely the sail thing. In June 1940, the destroyer was participating in fleet exercises east of Wake Island. Exactly what happened at this point does vary a bit between tellings, although they share a common theme. That being Tucker's crew trying to stretch her fuel supply. The main source on the matter, United States Navy destroyers of World War II, says this letting her maintain steerage way as she loitered on station several days, which would imply it was done simply to keep the ship's fuel going longer, not because the crew needed to, but just to stretch things out. Regardless of the exact reason, the result is clear to see. Tucker's crew used the ship's awnings, meant to keep them cool on a hot day, to make two sails. Both of her masts had these impromptu sails rigged up, which apparently allowed Tucker to sail at around three and a half knots, which was in an apparently light breeze. At least a couple stories say this was as much out of boredom as anything else. The caption of the picture from Life magazine indicates it was to relieve monotony of dull escort assignments. Navsource, for its part, says this, As far as I can tell, the notion of essentially spreading the ship's awning vertically to make a sail, was entirely Lieutenant Commander Gearing's idea. Whatever the case may be, it's incredible to think that this 1,500-ton destroyer could manage three and a half knots under improvised sail, especially since the ship was not, even slightly, designed to operate that way. But, well, never underestimate bored sailors. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one.